Support for Ben Franklin's World comes from the Omahundro Institute of Early American History and Culture. Peter Mancall is the director of the USC Huntington Early Modern Studies Institute in Southern California. The USC Huntington Early Modern Studies Institute supports historical research on human societies between 1450 and 1850. They support this work largely through fellowships and seminars. In addition to serving as the director of the USC Huntington Early Modern Studies Institute, Peter also makes time to serve on the Omahundro Institute's executive board and to chair its council. I asked Peter why he supports the Omahundro Institute and its mission to build our knowledge of the early North American past. What I find most compelling about what happens at the Omahundro is that this is a place that is just completely committed to furthering our knowledge of a discipline, a place that encourages scholars at all levels to really pursue information and to follow leads that they might not otherwise think of following. It is a commitment to excellence, which we want to see in every academic or cultural institution, but which is absolutely the hallmark of the Omohundro. You know, and that has made early America, in my opinion, the most fertile area of scholarship that I know in the historical sciences. The Omohundro Institute, promoting knowledge and excellence in early American history since 1943. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 79 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. What is a historical source? In episodes 70 and 75, we investigated how historians study the past using historical sources and how they access those sources in archives. Today, our quest to find out how historians know what they know about the past continues, And this time, we will explore the materials historians use to investigate the past, what they call historical sources. In this fourth episode of our Doing History, How Historians Work series, James Horn, the president and chief executive officer of the Jamestown Rediscovery Foundation, will guide us through what historical sources are and how they contribute to our knowledge about the past. During our exploration, Jim reveals why the Virginia Company established Jamestown and the interactions its early settlers had with Native Americans, the world Pocahontas lived in, and what historical sources are and how historians determine the credibility or authenticity of the information they contain. Are you ready to explore historic Jamestown and the different types of sources that allow historians to do history? Allow me to introduce you to James Horn. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, Here is this week's special guest. Our guest is the president and chief executive officer of the Jamestown Rediscovery Foundation. He has authored three books, including A Kingdom Strange, The Brief and Tragic History of the Lost Colony of Roanoke, and A Land as God Made It, Jamestown and the Birth of America. Today, he joins us as part of our Doing History, How Historians Work series to discuss historical sources. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, James Horn. Good to be here. Established in 1607, Jamestown was the first successful English settlement in North America. Jim, would you provide us with an overview of how the English came to establish a settlement along the James River? And would you also tell us why the English wanted a settlement in North America? I think you have to step back a century or so to get the context and to understand the English involvement in North America. We have to think about a world where Spain is the superpower of the day. And they had developed a huge empire in the Americas across the 16th century. They claimed all the Americas, North, South, and Middle America and the islands. And they were determined to keep any other European powers out. Enormous wealth had flowed from America to Spain. And because of that, they had developed a very powerful army and were dominant in Europe in terms of the warfare of of the day. They were a Catholic power as opposed to the English and some of the other states that were Protestant. So there was a religious element to these wars in Europe as well. 
to try to get some of the wealth of America that America offered. England and France were looking to establish colonies. In England's case, this really develops from the 1570s onwards. And the first sustained effort in this part of the world, in what we call the Mid-Atlantic, Virginia area, North Carolina area, was in the 1580s, led by or sponsored by Walter Raleigh, Queen Elizabeth's favorite. And this is the colony of Roanoke. It didn't succeed. And in fact, the last expedition to the colony disappeared. It's known as the lost colony of Roanoke and still a mystery as to what exactly happened to the hundred or so settlers that went down there. But there was interest by the English in this area, North America rather than South, because the Spanish were not so embedded in North America. They were primarily settled in South America, Middle America. There was a Spanish settlement down at St. Augustine in Florida, but no powerful fleets were this far up the North Atlantic coast. So there was an opportunity, in other words, for the English to explore North America and get a foothold, a Protestant foothold in the North American continent. And because of that, they looked primarily for a region such as this, large rivers, a big bay where they could bring ocean-going ships into the harbour. There were other expeditions elsewhere, up north in New England, what we would come to call Canada. But it was this area where most of the effort was made in the early 17th century. So really the English are trying to emulate the Spanish. They're trying to create an empire of their own in America. And they're also looking for the same sorts of things initially. They were looking for a passage through the American landmass that could be found in the mid-Atlantic, not just the Northwest Passage. And they were looking for gold and silver mines in the interior, wealthy Indian civilizations like the Aztec and Inca. So the English, in some ways, are trying to emulate the Spanish and claim the same kinds of riches and gain the same kind of power that the Spanish had during the 16th century. The first English colonists arrived in the Chesapeake on May 14, 1607. They landed on Jamestown Island. Jim, would you tell us about these settlers and about the settlement they created on Jamestown Island? Yeah, they arrived in the uh, in the Chesapeake Bay about two weeks earlier, at the end of April, erect a cross at the entrance of the Chesapeake Bay, a place called Cape Henry. I mention that because it is significant because maybe three or four weeks later, they set up another cross up the James River, maybe about 100 miles up from the coast, another cross there. And between those two crosses, that is to say, principally the James River Valley, that was considered English territory. So those two crosses marked English ground in America. They explored the James River. It looked a promising river, a broad river that might carry them far inland. And as I say, they have to bear in mind the English are looking to get inland. They don't want to settle on the coast. That might be too exposed to Spanish attack. And also, of course, the mountains were in the interior. This was already known. Europeans knew of the Appalachian mountain range, and they knew that that's where, if any precious minerals were to be found, it would be found inland, not on the coast. So they were looking to move further up into the interior. Jamestown is roughly about 50 miles from the coast, so it's about halfway as far as they should have come. They were told to go about 100 miles inland. But they found this island here and they thought it looked defensible. They could bring ships close into the island so they could easily unload their gear and it looked a promising place to establish their settlement. Captain John Smith, one of the first leaders on the first expedition, called it a very fit place for a city. Of course, it never developed into a city, but I think that was their intention initially. The kind of people that were on this expedition, they're all male. 105 men and boys left London in December of 1606. One died on the way in the West Indies, but 104 landed May 14th, 1607. They came from a fairly broad spectrum of 
backgrounds. There were plenty of gentlemen, younger sons of gentry, former soldiers, people that were looking to adventure. They were called adventurers rather than settlers. I'm not sure that many of them were really intending to settle very long. They're certainly not people that came over to farm the land. This isn't an issue of people leaving England because there's not enough land. They came really to make their fortune, kind of as if they were soldiers of fortune, really. There were some uh, working men, obviously, laborers, men that could put up the kind of dwellings they would need here. So think of it as an initial beachhead operation. They wanted to establish a settlement and they wanted a long-term settlement. It wasn't going to be a temporary trading post, but they had to send out a group of men that could pave the way for further settlers. These initial settlers or adventurers built what we know as James Fort. Would you tell us about James Fort and what it looked like? Let me step back a bit and describe Jamestown Island a little bit. It's very low-lying, huge river, James River. To English people looking at a river like this, they would have compared it to the Thames, which is the river that flows through London, the biggest river in England. So by English standards, they're looking at these enormous rivers. Early settlers described the landscape in terms of a forest set in, in the water. It was a glorious prospect for them. They had never seen anything quite like it. So the promise, if you like, of America, the promise of the new world was readily apparent to these men. Jamestown Island is very flat. It's a bit swampy in places. But as I say, there are a few areas of it that are a little bit higher ground. And that's where they started to encamp. And that's really what it was initially, a kind of camp under canvas, tents, under sailcloth, that kind of thing. And they put together a brushwood bulwark in the shape of a half moon that was far too flimsy. It didn't protect them from an Indian attack that occurred pretty soon after they'd arrived at the end of May. So after that, they quickly built a palisaded fort, a fort made of trees cut down from around and about quite a wooded area. This was actually a Indian hunting ground. It wasn't an area that was lived on anymore. It ever had been much by Indian peoples, but it was a hunting ground of the Paspahe people, one of the local peoples of this region. And they put together a triangular fort about 140 yards along the riverside, 100 yards on the other two sides. So it's a triangle with these bastions or bulwarks, each apex of the triangle where they mounted artillery. So pretty sturdy, and they built it incredibly quickly, which shows how desperate they were to protect themselves. And within it, initially, very few structures of any great note. As I say, I think the 1607 fort would have looked very much like a kind of canvas city, canvas town, tents everywhere. But a few structures, a storehouse, and maybe a couple of barracks they put together. So not much to see, but certainly safe enough once they had the palisade up. You mentioned this earlier. The English who established Jamestown did not settle uninhabited lands. Would you tell us about the Native Americans who lived in the area of Jamestown? I think one of the reasons the English came to the Mid-Atlantic and came to the Chesapeake Bay was because of a very powerful Indian people, a paramount chiefdom. It's like a chiefdom of maybe about 32 or so different Indian peoples stretched across a huge area from the south of the James River up to the Potomac. So this was a major Indian polity, a major Indian chiefdom called the Powhatans. And the reason why the English might have been attracted to it might seem counterintuitive, but the reason they may have been attracted to it was precisely because a powerful Indian nation such as the Powhatans might very well know where to go to find the gold and the silver. And in fact, their preeminence in this region might well stem from their access to precious minerals in the interior. So I think that's one of the reasons why the English come to this area. The Chesapeake is known a little from the Roanoke voyages of 20 years earlier. The Powhatans had developed as a chiefdom across the previous 30, 35 years, from maybe the uh, early 1570s, led by two incredible Indian chieftain warriors, one called Powhatan, and the tribe is named for him. His real name was Wahasanakok. And the other, his kinsman or brother, equally charismatic and powerful, was Upichankano. So these two chiefs were a huge influence on the growth 
of this powerful chiefdom. And we're looking at maybe about 15,000 men, women and children in this region, large region, as I say, when the English arrived. So you've got 104 men and boys at Jamestown, 15,000 Indian peoples around them, living mainly along the rivers, some on the coasts, not inland. They were different peoples inland, but up to the falls of the James River, up to the Piedmont in this region. You noted that the first settlers were adventurers and that they sought gold and silver. Many of us recall from our first lessons on Jamestown that these settlers were so obsessed with gold and silver that they didn't work for their own survival. Jim, is this true? Did the settlement at Jamestown almost fail because of the settlers' obsession with gold and their unwillingness to work? No, it's not. There's actually nothing wrong with looking for gold and silver. It's kind of looked at as kind of pie in the sky. But most European adventurers, the French in the 16th century, certainly the Spanish, the English were no different, were all interested in finding the gold and the silver and precious minerals in the mountains, as I say. So the English were doing no more than their earlier European counterparts. So because this was a private company, the Virginia Company of London was the sponsor of the uh, Virginia venture, just as Roanoke had been sponsored by an individual, Raleigh. So Virginia was sponsored by a trading company, the London Company. They had to make a profit. And what better way of raising money than by striking it rich and being able to get gold or silver back to London? So there's nothing unusual in that. And there's really nothing remarkable about it. And uh, really, the only surprising thing is that we're surprised. But that's part of the mythology, I'd say, of our early history that people were lazy. In fact, the Virginia enterprise was very well funded, at least in the uh, first few years. And there are all sorts of efforts to harvest the natural produce of the land and the water. We found evidence here at Jamestown of industries going on the first metalworking, the first trial of metals in uh, this part of the region. It's gone on at Roanoke, but it went on here too at Jamestown. So far from being lazy, there's an enormous amount of activity here during the early period and beyond, actually, when tobacco comes in, energy gets directed into that quarter. But early on, think of it in terms of gold and silver, searching for a passage to the Pacific, but also undertaking all sorts of industries related to timber, the kind of crops they've got here, metals, there are ideas to create wines, vineyards, silk, glass, a number of enterprises. So this was a kind of industrial complex as well as one that was devoted to exploration. Thus far, we've talked a lot about what historians know about Jamestown, but how do historians know what they know about Jamestown? Would you tell us about historical sources? What are historical sources and how do they inform our knowledge about the past? A historical source is a piece of evidence that can be uh, written. It could be a document from the period. There are any number of different kinds of written materials from the period. They might be eyewitness accounts, descriptions of the land, diaries that people kept, letters they sent back. Or they might be official documents setting up the colony, giving Virginia Company permission. The Virginia Company had to have permission from the King of England, James I, to create this colony here. So all sorts of documents, in other words, written materials, typically uh, the area of people like me, historians. So those documents are very important and they're quite abundant for the early period of Jamestown. We're always finding them. An enormous amount has been already unearthed, both in English archives and record offices, but also overseas, and particularly in Spain, where the Spanish had a very efficient bureaucracy, were very interested in what was going on up here, because as I said earlier, the Spanish didn't believe the English should be here or any other European should be here apart from them. And since this was a Protestant colony, they were planning to get rid of it, to uh, send warships up to Jamestown. So we can learn a great deal from those documents. But that said, there's a huge amount about Jamestown and the early settlement that we couldn't possibly know without archaeology. And it's the archaeology, the discovery of James Fort, the first fort, 1607, the discovery of that by archaeologists in 1994 and the 
subsequent field work that's been done here that allowed us to talk in much more detail about the everyday life of the first settlers here because we've unearthed something like two million artifacts so far from this site. It's an incredibly rich site. And those artifacts give us all sorts of insights into what people were doing here and how they survived or didn't survive, which actually, when you take that together with the documentary evidence, it's just a treasure trove of information for us. Do historians use any guidelines to determine whether a historical source is credible or authentic? Yeah, sometimes a source is unique, but you would look to its origins. If someone, for example, walked into my office with what they said was a document, say it was the lost diary of Captain John Smith, I'd never seen it before, I'd never heard of it. I realized that no one else had ever seen or heard of it. And even if it was written on antique paper or aged paper, I might be suspicious because there's no indication of where it came from. But having said that, you do, as I mentioned earlier, yeah, we're discovering new documents all the time. And you look to their origins, you look to try and trace the history of the document almost so that you can get a sense of where it's from. And then a technique that I think many historians employ is cross-checking with other documents from the period to see if there's any correspondence between them. If you like, there's a coming together of evidence through these documents that might give you a better sense as to their authenticity. But it can be a specialist kind of area, examining the paper, examining the ink, handwriting. There have been some very famous forgeries in the past, and sometimes it just takes experts even a panel of experts, to determine whether a document is real or not. And even then, sometimes people will disagree. But generally, I think historians can figure out whether something is authentic or not. Rick would like to know more about the relationship between historians and archaeologists. How does the work performed by archaeologists inform the work of historians? And how does the work performed by historians help archaeologists? Well, when you can bring together a historian or historians and archaeologists, I think it's a winning combination. And it's certainly been done at various different sites, perhaps not as much as one would have expected or might have been worthwhile. And that's partly because of the nature of the work. In a sense, two quite different specialized areas, different approaches. Archaeology is a very scientific approach and takes great training and skill. I'm not saying history doesn't, but it's a different kind of activity, mainly based in universities. One of the things that strikes me about archaeology is that there are very few archaeologists that can work just on their own. They've got to have a team, they've got to have a crew to actually do the physical work of uncovering sites. So archaeology tends to be very much more team-based. History is often very much more individual-based. But as I say, when it is possible to bring together the historical sources as well as the archaeology, it really is a terrific combination because there's so many ways in which Each can inform the other and to get a complete understanding or as complete as possible in some contexts, you simply have to have both if that's possible. So again, I'm going to give you a very quick example of this. We know that one of the first Africans to arrive in English North America, a woman from Angola called Angela, she arrived in Jamestown in 1620. We know her name. We know something of her history as to how she arrived. I think she was enslaved. She was captured in Angola and shipped out on a slave ship. That's about it. We know she was still alive in 1625. That's pretty much all we know about her. But we do know where she lived on Jamestown Island. And that site, even though there's nothing there now, is still accessible. And archaeologists, the crew here, will be digging that site this year to see if we can learn more about her. Sometimes just don't know. And that's a great thing about archaeology. There might be all sorts of things there that can tell us more about her life. We won't know until we dig beneath the earth. But the only way probably we're going to find out more about her and how she lived at Jamestown is through the archaeology. I don't believe there's any documentary source that could throw any light on that that's ever going to come to our attention. So it's got to be the archaeology. And I think being able to undertake that archaeology is very, very exciting. Let's explore the collaboration between archaeologists and historians in a case study. Would you tell us about Pocahontas? Who was she and why do we always associate her with Jamestown? 
Well, because she was an important person in early Jamestown, she was a member of the Powhatans and was one of the daughters of Powhatan Wahasanakok. She was probably born about 1595 in the mid-1590s, and we don't really know where she lived, but likely because her father was living about 30 miles or so from Jamestown, a place called Werricomico, the capital of the Powhatans at that time. She may well have been living there. I think that's most likely. So when the English arrive, something to bear in mind, and when she first meets Captain John Smith, she's still a young woman. I mean, she's only about 12 at that time. But she seems to have occupied an important place in her father's affections. And it seems to be that she was a highly intelligent young woman who quickly got to know the English and would travel over to the site with other Indians as escorts and struck up some kind of relationship with Captain John Smith. I think they were teaching each other the language. I think that's the basis of it. He was teaching her English. She was teaching him the Powhatan language. And we've got evidence of that from the words that were exchanged between them. John Smith wrote these Indian words down. So I think John Smith was taking the opportunity to use her as a way or befriend her in a way that would be helpful to the English because communications with the Indian peoples was vital, not just for trade, and the English were quite interested in trading with Indian peoples, but also in terms of information. We tend to think about Indians bringing the English food, which is true enough, and helping them survive, particularly through the first winter. But the Indian peoples were vital for information about, again, where to find the precious minerals. So young people, and the English did the same, young people may be anywhere from 10, 12, 15, were used as kind of go-betweens on the English side, mainly boys, but on the Indian side, I think Pocahontas is one of these, so girls as well, were used to go back and forth between the two peoples, very good at languages, and they were seen as non-threatening to the various parties. I think that's the role that Pocahontas plays. There's the dramatic event in the winter of 1607, where, according to John Smith, saves his life. I don't think she did it as such. I think what she did was involved in part of a ritual whereby John Smith was adopted into the Powhatan people. I think that's what happened in that particular case. But she certainly has an important role as this cultural go-between during the first few years of Jamestown. Most of what we know about Pocahontas and her fellow Native Americans came from written primary sources, writings by Englishmen such as Captain John Smith and Colonial Secretary William Strachey. These sources describe the colony and mention Pocahontas and her people. However, the Jamestown Rediscovery Foundation has an exhibit called The World of Pocahontas Unearthed. Jim, would you tell us about the Native artifacts that the Jamestown archaeologists have unearthed? What do these artifacts tell us about the world Pocahontas lived in? Well, we have here at Jamestown a time capsule. We have an original site that contains materials from the earliest contact points between the Indian peoples and the English, 1607, through to the outbreak of the sustained period of hostilities in 1609. That's a very important period for us because we can identify those years and identify the artifacts that were deposited here at Jamestown Fort. One very interesting find is that Indians, and we believe mainly women, were living inside the fort. So we sometimes think, (laughs) quite reasonably enough, of the English inside the palisade, Indian peoples outside the palisade. As I say, that's true enough, but there were clearly a number of Indian women. It's hard to say how many, but it could certainly have been a dozen, maybe a couple of dozen Indian women working within the fort, mainly at food preparation. Remember, at this time, most of the English settlers are male. So there's food preparation, washing. We found evidence of bead making, putting together strings of beads that could be used in trade. There was, in other words, a cultural exchange going on within the fort as well as around the fort. So this evidence could only be found through the archaeology. There's very little written evidence of this. As you say, we can focus on the story of Pocahontas, but it looks like there was an important presence of other women. Whether they were in relationships with some of the men, we simply can't say, but we would argue they played an important role in the early fort. 
And that means that we're dealing with a situation where Indian peoples and English are living in very close quarters and the English are learning all sorts of things from the Indian peoples about how best to survive. They adopt, for example, Indian corn very early on. They're not growing English grains, they're growing Indian corn. So the English are adapting very rapidly with the help of Indian peoples. And you might ask, what's in it for the Indians? You could argue that this is a, a sort of invasion force that's arriving. But the Indian peoples, and particularly Powhatan and Okachankana, they're looking for English trade goods, commodities. They're particularly looking for copper. Copper is to the Indian peoples, it's almost like gold. Copper could be used to buy all sorts of things. So the more copper you had, the wealthier you were as a people. So the Powhatans were looking to have a monopoly of English copper. But the other thing that the Powhatans wanted were English edge tools. Indian peoples did not have the use of hard metals like iron and steel. They did have their own forms of copper. They didn't value it as much as the English copper, but they didn't have steel or iron axes or tools or weapons. And they were very interested in acquiring all of those, but particularly the weapons, including firearms. They were intrigued with firearms and wanted to get their own saw of firearms and ammunition. So there's something in it here for both sides. And this early period is almost like a series of negotiations and positioning of Indian peoples on the one hand and English peoples on the other. You've touched on this a bit, but I wonder if you would speak specifically about how the artifacts archaeologists have found confirm or challenge what written sources have said about Pocahontas and her fellow Native Americans. I think specifically, we have to reassess the idea that you have English people living in Jamestown, isolated from the Indian people who are around them and visit occasionally, but basically keep their distance. In the first years, we think there's much more interaction. There's more intense interaction between the Indian peoples and the English than historians had previously thought. And we get a sense of that from the sheer quantity of Indian ceramics, pots, a humble kind of cooking pot. These survive well in the ground, but also some formal material, tools that have been shaped by Indian peoples, tools as bone needles or antlers that have been shaped into picks or whatever it might be. These kinds of artifacts and the sheer quantity of them within the fort indicate this presence. So a lot of research, it's not necessarily about finding the answers, but finding the questions. And this discovery of Indians within the fort has led us to ask a number of questions about, well, what was really going on at this time? And what was the relationship exactly between these peoples? Who were these women that lived in the fort? What did they come mainly from, as you would imagine, from neighboring peoples, people just a mile or a couple of miles away? And was there some kind of intelligence system going on whereby information gathered by these women was somehow relayed back from the fort to power? Powhatan and Okachenkano. I think that's very likely. I think William Strachey mentions this, that the Indians are always watching them and that there's a great deal of interest by the chiefs particularly about the shipping that's coming back and forth, how many people are arriving and what's going on at the fort. So this is part of this process of sounding each other out and trying to assess both the benefits of a relationship and also the disadvantages of the English presence at Jamestown Island. But we now know that there's a much more intense interaction between the two peoples than even was thought before. We know a lot about the histories of Native American peoples because of what both European and American written sources say and what archaeological evidence tells us. But we also gain insight into Native American history through oral traditions. Jim, are oral traditions historical sources? They are and they can be very important sources. They really comprise a specialist area in their own right because the standards by which they might be assessed, again, as to authenticity, veracity, those standards really require specialist knowledge to ensure that they're being applied. 
it's sometimes very difficult to test what you might gain from oral history against written sources. It could be that there's only the oral history to go on. But at a number of different levels, oral history can play an enormously important part in filling in gaps, or perhaps it's more than that. There's absolutely no sense of what happened. There's no evidence of what happened. The oral traditions handed down across generations are the only possible source. And in that case, you're left with almost a take-it-or-leave-it approach, really, because there's no way of scientifically, if you like, judging whether or not the oral account is accurate. So a couple of things I think you have to bear in mind, though, is that if five people watch the same event, exactly the same event, it's more than likely that you'll get five different accounts or at least three different accounts. Take it five years later and people will forget important details. Now, I'm not saying oral traditions are the same as simply seeing random events. But 400 years is a long, long time. And the peoples of this region went through an enormous upheaval as a consequence of the European arrival. And many tribes really lost their coherence. The Indian language has been greatly undermined. It survived, but barely in places, uh, not at all. So I think Indian peoples of this region have done a magnificent job in maintaining their traditions and their oral history. But purely from judging it from historical accuracy, that requires very, very careful attention. Would you tell us about the historic Jamestown Archaearium and whether historians and written sources play a role in creating exhibits like the world of Pocahontas on Earth? The Archaearium is frankly a made-up word, a place of old things, to describe our archaeology museum. I think it's a little gem of a museum. It's not huge. You can easily go around the whole museum in half an hour, less if you really need to, but it's full of some of the star artifacts that we've uncovered over the past 20 years. Now, I say some, just a small fraction of the two million that we have are exhibited, but they represent some of the key classes, categories of artifacts and represent pretty much every aspect of daily life here at Jamestown in the first 20 years or so of settlement. So particularly focused on what we call the James Fort period from 1607 through to the early 1620s including, and this is why we opened the World of Pocahontas exhibit, we wanted to ensure that our visitors understood just what an important role Indian peoples played in the early settlement. The phrase that historians and archaeologists often use is material culture. And these are literally the materials, the objects, the artifacts, the everyday things, some objects that maybe aren't, like weaponry and armor, but they're the stuff of life and they're the materials that make up our culture. Many of these objects, at least the English ones, came out of London. And again, one way of thinking about Jamestown is of a far-flung suburb of London because all sorts of goods were coming out of London and being shipped over across the Atlantic. Maybe it took about 10 to 12 weeks coming and maybe about six weeks going back. But you could bring in large quantities of goods and you could ship back large quantities of goods. So there is this flow of objects from Europe and actually from all over the world. We found Chinese porcelain here from the early 17th century. Goods that come into London and then are shipped out to Jamestown. In other words, you can tell the biography or the history of objects and how they were shipped out, used and employed here. And again, another example, which must be one of the most remarkable objects we've ever found here. It's a humble kind of object, a stone that was used as ship's ballast, but it dates from the Roman period, that is to say the Roman period in England. And when we first found it here at Jamestown, we were wondering whether the Roman actually rode across the Atlantic in their galleys, but we quickly discounted that. So it's a ballast stone, probably from the Thames. It's got Roman markings on it. It's brought to Jamestown, and somehow it was then picked up by maybe some of these Indian women working in the Jamestown port and used as a kind of mortar and pestle used for grinding nuts or grinding corn. So it becomes transformed 
into what's called a nutting stone. You bring a rock to bear on the stone and you grind with that and was used by Indian peoples. It began as Roman. 15, 1600 years earlier, then was shipped out to Jamestown and then gets used by power town women for a humble domestic use. So, you know, a fantastic story of use and reuse of a very humble object. Let's move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if in 1994, William Kelso and his archaeological team had not discovered the original James Fort on Jamestown Island? How would what we know about Jamestown and its history be altered if we did not have the nearly two million artifacts archaeologists have uncovered from that site? In a couple of major respects, our view of Jamestown would be quite different. It would be based pretty much completely on the documentary evidence, which would mean that we would have no idea about the structure of the fort, the buildings, the daily lives of people. You mentioned earlier that there is a conception that the first English to arrive were lazy, obsessed with gold and so on. But the discoveries here have completely overturned that. The evidence we found about the presence of Indian peoples, the way in which the fort develops over the years, all of these things would not be known. The richness of the material culture here, just how well the settlers were equipped. There is a rather grisly story about the starving time where it's really a a siege of Jamestown in the winter of 1609, 1610. This is during the first war with the Power Towns. Power Town warriors surround the fort and cut the fort off. About 300 English settlers, men, women and children inside who are decimated by disease and famine and many of them starved. And there were rumors, more than that actually, descriptions from the documentary evidence that there was survival cannibalism at Jamestown during this period, that people had taken up the dead and eaten them to survive. And it was hard to know whether that was true or whether that was an exaggeration, and plenty of historians believed it was an exaggeration meant to defame the colony during a period when there was a lot of criticism of the way Virginia was being run. But actually, in 2012, we discovered the remains of a young girl, 14-year-old English girl, who bore unmistakable marks of cannibalism. And that confirmed what a dark period that was in Virginia's early history, that people were reduced to that kind of plight. So without these details, you can't bring history to life. And I think for many people, and this is true of the work we do here, it's how can you explain to a broader public, to students, what went on and the significance of what took place. This is a very important place. There's no guarantee that without Jamestown, if Jamestown had failed, if Jamestown had collapsed, this is a different maybe approach to this counterfactual history. But if Jamestown had collapsed, and that was possible several times in its early history, there's no guarantee that modern America, as we know it, would have evolved. It's quite possible that either the French or the Dutch would have moved into this region. There may have been a New England, but it would have only have been a New England. And North America may have ended up looking rather more like South America, a series of sovereign countries. So the evidence that we're able to gather here speaks about our very beginnings as a people. And as a people, I mean, not just the English, of course, but the interactions between the English, Indian peoples, and when the Africans arrive, between them too. So this is the origins of Americans and American society. And knowing as much as we can about that development, I think is very important to understanding better who we are and where we came from. Would you tell us whether the Jamestown Rediscovery Foundation has any events or exhibits coming up that we should be aware of? We do, actually. We have a very interesting exhibit that will be open in June at the Archaearium, which focuses on religion. And religion is an incredibly important part of early Jamestown's history. The first Anglican church is built here, of course, in 1608. 
and it's a big structure. There are Catholics here also, and this is part of this struggle between Protestants and Catholics that's taking place on the grand scale in Europe and in America also. That is represented here at Jamestown. So we want to exhibit and showcase a extraordinary object, a small silver box. It is about two inches long, an inch wide, hexagonal in shape that we discovered last year in the grave of a prominent settler buried in the chancel of that first church in 1609, probably during the starving time. This little silver box can't open it. It's corroded tight, so we can't open it without destroying it. But through our high resolution CAT scans, we're able to see inside it. It turns out it was a Catholic relic holding saints' bones and holy oil that had been brought over with this particular individual, Captain Gabriel Archer, one of the early leaders of Jamestown, well known to Captain John Smith. Looks like he was a uh, secret Catholic or someone that knew him well was a Catholic who placed this object in his grave and it stayed there for 400 years until we discovered it. But the point of the silver box, even though it's a a unique piece in its own right, is to underline, this is what I mean about raising questions, it is to underline the importance of religion in early Virginia, not just in the northern colonies, but also here, and the role that religion plays in early English conceptions of what an English America would look like. An English America would be a Protestant bulwark against the Catholic Spanish. So this small exhibit in the Archearium will speak to those themes. And then the other point I'd like to underline to emphasize is that we are a site, a historical site, where we have archaeology open nine months of the year from March through to November, sometimes even December if the weather accommodates us. And you can actually see here archaeologists working. You can ask them questions. You can see what they're bringing out of the ground. For the first time in 400 years, you're going to be seeing things that no one else has has seen. And I can tell you the visitors that we have have here absolutely love that it's very unusual to be able to get very close to an archaeological dig and that's what we offer here because we want to again we want to bring history alive bringing this material out of the ground is part of a incredibly complex three-dimensional jigsaw to put together a picture of the life that people led here Where is the best place to look for more information about the Jamestown Rediscovery Foundation, its exhibits, and how we can get in contact with you in case we still have questions about Jamestown and historical sources? The best source is our website, and it's historicjamestown.org. And Jamestown, in this case, is spelt with an E at the end, so historicjamestown.org. And there's all sorts of information about us and how to contact us on that site. Jim, thank you for helping us explore the history of Jamestown and what different historical sources tell us about it. Oh, you're more than welcome. And I'd say please follow the news on our website. And if you're able, come and see us sometime. Documents, objects, and oral traditions. Historians use all of these sources to inform what they know about the past. Now, historians don't often take the information provided by sources at face value. Before they believe a source, they use their training to test the credibility of the information contained within it. They do this by researching who created the information, the context in which the creator created the source, and they compare information in one source to that contained within other sources. For example, remember the starving time? Written sources indicated that Jamestown colonists resorted to eating the dead. However, historians had no way to prove the credibility of that information without archaeological evidence. Which brings us to another important collaboration in the field of history. Historians and archaeologists both work with information about the past. Archaeologists uncover information by digging objects out of the ground, objects that they share with historians. In turn, historians help archaeologists interpret these objects by providing context. Historians tell archaeologists about the people who either used or might have used uncovered objects, why and how the objects likely arrived at the place where the archaeologists found them, And they also share information about the larger historical period. As Jim mentioned, collaborations between historians and archaeologists are invaluable. They often help both professions know more about the past. You can find more information about Jim, the Jamestown Rediscovery Foundation, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 079. If you're enjoying the Doing History series, you should really check out the website of our series partner, the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture. 
The Omohundro Institute sponsors many programs that promote knowledge and excellence in the field of early American history. And on their website, you'll find lots of information about all the ways they help further what we know about the past. Plus, you'll also find a page with a complete listing of all our Doing History episodes. Visit benfranklinsworld.com slash OI or click on the link in the show description right in your Ben Franklin's World app. Finally, Jim revealed a lot about the history of Jamestown. What surprised you most or what aspect of its history did you find most interesting? Send your answers to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment on the show notes page or in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.